Could you tell us about the Métis community at Sault Ste. Marie? Um, uh, this one always gets me in trouble with the guys out west. Um, the Métis community in Sault Ste. Marie, there's a core to it, and there's other ones that come in, there's other people that come in and out. Um, I think Mitch talks about that. Um, the Métis in Sault Ste. Marie, they were settled um, in what was called French Town, which is basically where the power canal is today. That was the big settlement, although there was lots all the way through Sault Ste. Marie. Um, that community, in 1850, there was a promise made by uh, Robinson that if they wanted to, they could join the reserves. Uh, some families did join Batchewan or Jarden River, other ones refused, because also within Robinson's speech, there was a hint, a hint that they would come up and negotiate with the Métis separately. That hint and negotiation was surveys to survey out property lines, right? Judge Prince and other notables in Sault Ste. Marie managed to take away all the Métis property, um, which forced a significant number of the Métis to move to Gouli Bay, because um, Gouli Bay at that time was fairly inaccessible and was a good fishing station. And there was a few Anishinaabe and Métis out there already. Um, they ran into problems with American fishermen poaching in our waters, but that's a different story. Um, you know, so the Métis community, there was a community here, there was a sense of identity. Um, they were treated differently in the United States. Um, in the United States, under the treaties there, um, they had um, claims of first class, uh, first class half-breed, second class half-breed, and third class. Um, their their um, numbers of what a first class half-breed was, was half Anishinaabe, half something else. So if you were half Anishinaabe and half Dakota, you wanted, you could fall under this clause because you were a first class half-breed because you weren't fully Anishinaabe. <laughs> so you get these people that are, that are later seen as Indian in later treaties out in the United States, out further west, out in Minnesota, the name reappears, but in the Sioux they opted to take the cash payout. That was, you know, other second class, Second class half-breeds were people that were usually um, part Anishinaabe and mainly European, right? And then the thirds were people that were even barely, you know, as the, as um, under American rules, it would be blood quantum, but it's not really, you know, as, the, as it goes down. And that, the Métis community there became more incorporated into the town, those that stayed and those that didn't become seen as Indian. Um, but, I, you know, I mean, the Métis community in the, inside downtown Sault Ste. Marie, I mean, all their lands were gradually stolen from them or taken away, taken away, stolen legally, right? You know, you don't pay your, you don't pay your militia dues, you know, okay, your property is seized and forfeited. And, you know, because if you look in the old, um, the really old survey maps for Sault Ste. Marie, you can see all these river lots they used to have. And you can see the names. There's one, um, one I saw in um, the archives of Ontario, this huge map, the old survey, old, French surveys, and you see the French names crossed out, or the Métis names crossed out, and you see this, you know, sim you see the um, the settler names written in over top, and then you see them get chopped up into squares, and more names appear, and things like this. So it's it's, but the Métis community here in town, you know, they participated in the fur trade, the cartage business, which was really big before they built the canal. Um, they did fishing, which was also really big until the 18, God, I want to say 1870s although my brain's telling me it was pretty much disappearing by the 1860s. Um, big in the, ma in the maple sugar trading too. You know, they were, they were businessmen, they were, you know, um, travelers in the trade, participation, participants in all sorts of different things. Um, but eventually, you know, under the Canadian census, all the Métis up here get classified as French. You know, so in, in one sense, you know, according to the governments, at least up until 2003, there was no Métis here, they were French, right, which was a big shock to Sioux and other people, but hey, wait a minute, there is a Métis community in Sault Ste. Marie. <laughs> um, but you can always, you can trace the names, the families, and when you look at the, um, um, the genealogy records and who married who, you can always see them marrying with themselves or marrying into the reserves. You know? There's even... Um, Garden River, there's a spot called Frenchman's Bay where a lot of Métis moved to become Indians under, you know, when they agreed to join with Shinwalk and say, okay, we'll settle here and be, become Garden River band members. There's Frenchman's Bay um, there. A lot, of a lot of mixed families or mixed, mixed people settled along it. So, you know, there's, there's indications where the Métis lived and settled and what they became. 
but it, it's also hard to put, pin down um, who exactly, I mean, I'm sure Mitch would disagree with me on this, but um, it's really hard at, one, at some points to pin down what family exactly is Métis, because in, you know, in 1830, there, there are Métis people here, there is a Métis community, but some members of that community, depending who shows up in town, may see that person as an Indian, right? Because they're off hunting with Shinwalk, so they're you know, dressed like an Indian. Well, okay, that guy's an Indian. And then three weeks later, somebody else will show up and go, oh, you know, that, that's so-and-so, he's really white. You know, so it, it's one of these things where you know, the community knows who it is and you can see it in the records. But because the identity issues aren't hard and fast, so this idea of racial lines really starts to, I mean, it starts to come into play in the 1830s amongst the settlers, but you don't really get hard and fast lines for another 10 or 20 years, but you start seeing people trying to draw lines between communities. And while the communities themselves knew this is the Métis community, this is Shinwalk's followers, this is the Anishinaabe and stuff, they were all, we all saw each other as related, and people could move between the two, depending on who they married, who their friends were, who their relatives were. You know, there was this ability to move if they wanted to, um, which really stops. Um, it's, it's, which really stops, I'd say, you start seeing it stop and solidify by the 1850s and people say you can't do this anymore.